Where is the money? That's the question on many New Yorkers' minds as the city grapples with financial strain. It's a hot topic right now, especially with over 160,000 asylum seekers hitting the scene from the southern border. We're in some serious financial trouble right now. Mayor Adams made these statements after the city announced major budget cuts. Adams says the migrant crisis is to blame. But hold on a second. Is the city's budget suffering because of them? Or is there some sneaky business with the funds? Some say it's all down to the asylum crisis, that the city's resources are stretched thin, but others aren't buying it. They're pointing fingers at something else, mismanagement of cash. Yep, you heard it right. Some folks reckon the city's throwing dough at projects that are, let's just say, not exactly top priority. So what's the real deal here? We're diving deep into New York City's money matters. We'll dig through the numbers and get to the bottom of whether it's truly the asylum seekers draining the budget or if there's more to the story. Stick around. This investigation's about to uncover some juicy truths behind the budget buzz. Amid New York City's financial struggles due to the ongoing crisis, there's been a lot of talk about how money's being spent. One thing that's raised eyebrows is the decision to plant trees right in the middle of the sidewalk. It's kind of like putting a roadblock in the way of people trying to walk. Residents in Astoria woke up this week to new trees planted on the streets, only they were planted in the middle of the sidewalk, and not everybody's happy with this landscaping decision. And guess what? Each of these trees costs a whopping $3,600. That's a lot of cash for something that's causing inconvenience. Wow, I've never actually seen anything like it. Space is being taken up by trees and it leaves us no space to walk. Sarah Tsuli, a resident, was interviewed about this tree planting project. But it gets even crazier. When people complained about these trees taking up valuable sidewalk space, the city had to spend another $3,600 per tree just to remove them. That's a total waste of money. And to fill up the holes left behind with cement? That's more money down the drain. Meanwhile, the trees that were already planted along the sidewalks seem to have been forgotten. They're not getting the care they need, and dog owners are finding it tough to find space for their pets to do their business. That's sure to be taken over by dogs and create even more space for unplowed snow to pile up. With over 666,000 trees in the city and thousands more being planted or replanted every year, you'd think there'd be plenty of greenery to go around. But with $72 million being spent annually just on managing these trees, it seems like there's not much left over to make sure they're being looked after properly. All right, let's break down this $100 million public health call center project. Yes, you heard it right, $100 million for a call center. Now, this call center, slated to start next year, is no ordinary hotline. It's set to be equipped with doctors, nurses, and all the medical workers you'd find in a hospital. But it's all for phone calls. Yep, you heard that correctly. People can call in, whether they're doctors, members of the public, or anyone needing health advice, and they'll get assistance over the phone. Now, on the surface, this might seem like a good idea. I mean, who hasn't Googled their symptoms and ended up convinced they have some rare disease? A reliable hotline could be a lifesaver for emergencies or just for getting accurate medical advice. But here's where the skepticism kicks in. First off, that hefty $100 million contract only covers the operation for six years. After that, it's up in the air and needs to be renewed. And some folks are questioning whether this money could have been better spent. For one, could a robust website have been built for less money, offering the same services indefinitely? Then there's the issue of scale. This call center is expected to handle a whopping 40,000 calls a day. Sounds impressive, right? Well, consider this. New York City has 8 million residents. If 40,000 of us try to call in, that's only serving a tiny fraction of the population each day. With wait times inevitable, it begs the question, is this really the best use of funds? especially when the city is tightening its belt in so many other areas. So, while the intentions behind the call center might be noble, there's valid concern about whether it's the most effective solution for New Yorkers, especially given its hefty price tag and limited reach. If you thought the 100 million public health call center was expensive, wait until you hear about the Long Island Railroad East Access Project. Long Railroad riders had been told for years that they'd be able to take a train to Grand Central Terminal by the end of 2022. Also known as America's most expensive, most delayed train project. This mammoth undertaking comes with a jaw-dropping price tag of $11.6 billion. Now, unlike the questionable tree planting project, this railroad project does serve a purpose. Before its construction, folks riding the Long Island Railroad had no direct route to Grand Central Terminal, one of the city's premier train stations. This new station is expected to cater to a staggering 160,000 commuters daily, shaving a cool 40 minutes off their travel time. And get this, the escalator ride down to the train tracks takes a whole minute. But here's the kicker. This project has been a long time coming. The idea was first floated in 1963, with funding secured in the 90s. 
construction has been underway for a whopping 15 years, with the station finally completed, sitting 17 stories below ground. Yet despite its grandeur, the project's cost and timeline have raised more than a few eyebrows. Originally slated to cost $2.1 billion, the project ballooned to a staggering $11.6 billion. That's five times the initial estimate. As for timing, it was supposed to open in 2009, but didn't see the light of day until 2023, a whopping 14 years behind schedule. Critics have latched onto this project as a prime example of the city's financial woes. With costs spiraling out of control and delays piling up, it's no wonder folks are questioning where all the money is going. This project, once hailed as a game changer, now stands as a stark reminder of the challenges facing New York City's budgetary management. 10 years after the initially promised completion date of 2013, outlined in the 2006 FTA full funding grant agreement, which capped the federal share at $2.6 billion out of a total $6.3 billion cost, the project is now $5 billion over budget. This does not include an additional $1 billion for financing costs and $4 billion for associated Lear readiness projects, bringing the total cost to $16.6 billion. Despite these challenges, Lear commuters, taxpayers, funding agencies, and transit advocates continue to seek improvements and accountability. Let's talk about the use of luxury hotels as emergency shelters for asylum seekers. So walking through these doors every day, more than 400 people per day. It's a situation that's drawn both attention and criticism. Imagine this, swanky hotels, usually reserved for high paying guests, now housing those seeking refuge. On the surface, it might seem like a noble gesture, providing temporary shelter to those in need, but scratch beneath the surface and you'll find a tangled web of controversy. First off, there's the cost. Luxury hotels don't come cheap, and the city's coffers are feeling the strain. With funds already stretched thin, some are questioning whether this is the most prudent use of taxpayer money. Couldn't these funds be better directed towards more sustainable housing solutions? According to recent news from Bloomberg, New York City pays premium rates per night for budget hotel rooms for migrants. Despite the city cutting services to manage expenses, some struggling hotels charge premium rates for emergency housing. For instance, the Holiday Inn in Manhattan's financial district, facing financial challenges, filed for bankruptcy in November. Shortly after, Mayor Eric Adams's administration offered to rent all 492 rooms to house around 15,000 migrants over the next 15 months. The hotel, typically charging $110 per night, would receive $190 per room, a 73% increase. Additionally, the city would guarantee full occupancy, expecting only 70% occupancy otherwise. The deal was seen as making the Holiday Inn a good corporate citizen, and was anticipated to yield a significant $10.5 million profit, as per a bankruptcy filing. My heart breaks a little bit, and I have these conflicting feelings, said the deputy mayor. She is proud of the care the city is offering, but sad that it's unsustainable. Then there's the issue of optics. In a city grappling with homelessness and affordable housing shortages, the sight of asylum seekers being housed in luxury accommodations can feel like a slap in the face to those struggling to make ends meet. It raises questions about equity and fairness in resource allocation. And let's not forget about logistics. Luxury hotels aren't exactly equipped to handle the needs of asylum seekers, many of whom may require specialized support services. From language barriers to cultural sensitivities, there are numerous challenges to overcome in ensuring these individuals are properly cared for. Ultimately, while the use of luxury hotels may provide a short-term fix, it's not a sustainable solution. As the city continues to grapple with the complexities of the asylum crisis, there's a pressing need to explore more viable long-term housing options that prioritize both dignity and efficiency. To watch episodes about this topic, subscribe to our channel for more videos like this one. Imagine being in a vulnerable position, seeking asylum in a new country, only to be met with meals that are not just unappetizing, but downright inedible. Unfortunately, this has been the reality for some asylum seekers in New York City. Raw, cold, and expired. That's how refugees living here at the Roe Hotel describe the food they're being served by the city. Residents point to pasta covered in grease and meatballs still frozen in the middle. Reports have surfaced alleging that resources allocated for meals intended for asylum seekers have been mismanaged, resulting in food that is unfit for consumption. It's a distressing situation that raises serious questions about the city's commitment to providing basic necessities for those in its care. But that is not what the mayor of New York thinks. Mayor Adams emphasized, People may have a different uh, cultural taste for certain foods. We can't do that. We can only provide 
nutrition, food for people. The mayor, along with his hospital overseeing the Rowe Hotel, which has become home to hundreds of Latin American migrants, insists there is nothing wrong with the food provided here. Beyond the ethical implications, there are practical concerns as well. Inedible meals not only fail to meet the nutritional needs of asylum seekers, but also undermine efforts to foster a sense of dignity and respect for these individuals. It's a stark reminder of the challenges inherent in managing large-scale humanitarian crises and the importance of effective oversight and accountability. Asylum seekers deserve to be treated with compassion and dignity, especially during their time of need. The allegations of wasted resources on inedible meals serve as a sobering reminder of the work that remains to be done to ensure that the most vulnerable members of society are adequately supported and cared for. As we wrap up our exploration into New York City's handling of the asylum crisis and financial management, one thing is clear, there are valid concerns on both fronts. While it's easy to point fingers and assign blame, the truth is often more nuanced. Yes, the asylum crisis has undoubtedly strained the city's resources, but it's not the sole culprit behind New York's budget woes. As we've seen, instances of fund mismanagement and questionable spending decisions have also played a significant role. It's time for a reckoning, a moment where city officials take a hard look in the mirror and acknowledge the need for change. Blame shifting won't solve the underlying issues that are impacting both New Yorkers and asylum seekers alike. Real change requires accountability, transparency, and a genuine commitment to prioritizing the needs of all residents. At the end of the day, it's the people of New York City and the asylum seekers who bear the brunt of these failures. From inadequate housing to inedible meals, the consequences are real and far-reaching. So, as we reflect on the challenges facing the city, let's also consider this. Do you think the city is wasting money? We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more thought-provoking discussions on pressing issues like these. Together, let's strive for a better, more equitable future for all.